Howdy, everyone. This is obviously the Strange Glasses uh, exhibition that we've got going on here today. So today I'm super excited to have uh, Joe Quattrone with me. Joe is a seasoned social media and content marketing professional. Started off with Audi in America. In 2013, caught the eye of the very uh, famous Gary Vaynerchuk, or Gary V, leading to a significant role at VaynerMedia. But he's now transitioned into his own business, which is focusing on a very interesting industry, the cannabis industry. And this is where he's going to leverage his digital marketing skills to establish new brands in this space. Joe, welcome. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. Appreciate it. So you've worked on a couple on a couple of industries, and we've gone from automobiles to alcohol, and selling a motor car versus selling beer. Those are two, I suppose, it's a similar target market, but you know, very different price price points. Let's talk Sorry. about. Let's talk about. Your your start in the industry, in particular with Audi and uh, the Germans. Yeah, and it wasn't just a, a price parity. It was luxury vehicles to boot. So it was way different. Obviously, it was uh, in the very early days of social media when I started working with Audi. So there really wasn't like ultra affluent luxury marketing happening in social media in those days. But um, the CMO, Scott, one of my great uh, mentors in life, he always pushed us to be as innovative as possible. And for what we could do, try to be the first at it. So that was kind of our mentality that we took into everything, uh, which is not all that different from, you know, being in social media in any phase of my career for any major brand. That's always been uh, a major ask is, is try to be first, try to be new, try to be unique, try to recruit specifically younger customers, younger demographics, uh, for the car brands, it's uh, actually, I would say car and beer, you know, like Anheuser Busch, which was one of my large portfolios that I managed at, uh, under dairy. A lot of those brands were in consistent decline for decades, which wasn't really the same for Audi, but they both needed to age down for different reasons. You know, Audi is in every other luxury mark for that matter. They needed to recruit the next generation of shoppers that were going to come of age in the next 10 years. Budweiser needed to, to figure out a way to stay relevant with younger people. So not necessarily for 10 years down the road for kind of immediate consumption. So there's a lot of similarities, a lot of differences. I think that the largest one being, and probably the reason why I wound up working on like eight or nine Super Bowl spots in the first 10 years of my career was they love to spend money on Super Bowl ads. <laughs> lots of car brands, lots of beer brands doing Super Bowl ads. And I've worked on a bunch. <laughs> Well, I think if we look at what happened on the the previous Super Bowl ads with with Bud Light, you know, it can either make money or lose <laughs> lose a lot of money for you as well. Sure, but can. interesting interesting point you bring up there about how Audi's focus is sort of ten years and Budweiser a much shorter shorter time period. And I think a lot of folks forget that's why you do brand advertising. You're not necessarily mm-hmm. trying to get the customer today. You want them right. to have that screen. Sa- in the olden days, it would have been a post on your wall, but you know now to be a screensaver or something, where you build liking, familiarity, and just get them onto that. Onto that. What's the what's the correct word? Oh God, it's gone now. But the the, the bunch of brands that you need to have in mind when you're trying to make a decision. The, the consideration consideration yeah, set. There we go. Just disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in the world of cars, we always took from the racetrack and it had halo vehicles that kind of, you know, brought the technology down to the range. And it's so interesting you bring up the the word kind of like poster or kind of bringing, putting it on, a, on a, a poster on a kid's wall or something like that. That was exactly a conversation that me and Scott had in the restroom one day, actually, during a Super Bowl campaign. The agency was going back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. And I remember looking at the spot and saying, you know, we're missing a key opportunity here. This co- it's, this was the R, was it R8? It was either the R8 or one of the higher end, like faster RS or S model vehicles. And I was like, we're missing the point here. Like, this is a, this is a car that kids are going to want to have on their wall. So we should figure out a way to, to weave some of that kind of storytelling in there. And, and it actually wound up making its way into the TV spot. So we were from a very early stage trying to figure out how to, how to make the young people really attracted to the brand so that when they grew up, it would be something that they'd want to get into or even not, not even wait around for when they grew up, they could influence their parents. 
So the, the funny thing now is how fast branding and how perceptions are changing. So if one has a look at the likes of Audi, where you're trying to build awareness and perception over you know, a 10-year period so that those folks can come and be a customer, we look at something called customer lifetime value. So these ads, they're going to bear fruit in a couple of years, in, you know, in a decade or five years' time, etc. If you look at Budweiser and you look at other sort of more fast consumer, consumer goods, in the past, those brands were pretty stable and they had a, a stable you know, potential future audience. Now that audience, especially if you look at what happened to Budweiser, is completely the perceptions around the brand or uh, perceptions in terms of society are changing quite quickly. And yeah, it's quite tough for them. You've got to be, you've got to be on your toes and, and have your finger on the pulse of where the, your audience is now versus where they're going to be in a couple of years. Not yeah. to mention the introduction of electric vehicles, which I'm sure is also in, would have impact on, on, on Audi and a lot of other car brands where new ones like BYD and Polestar mm -hmm. have just come out of nowhere. Yeah. I saw an article the other day, BYD just overtook Tesla for the number one electric car mark in the, in the world. And they're doing it on the lower end of the spectrum from a cost perspective. So now we're hearing about what's it, Project Redwood out of Northern California, which might be like a $25,000 Tesla to try to compete with BYD. So it's super interesting for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I read that today actually about Redwood and yeah, the, the industry, I mean, the Chinese are able to churn if they can turn out washing machines and dishwashers and things like that very cheaply, they are going to be able to generate motor cars. But the thing is you don't drive a washing machine and it is, the likelihood of a washing machine killing you is quite low, whereas in the motor car. So I think there's, I think Tesla's still got a bit, of, a bit of space. Some of the lessons you learned from working with Gary and his team, and I mean, you're working in the, and if you pardon the expression, in the Super Bowl in yeah. terms of, of the ad world. So that's not regular advertising. That's a one shot, one big ad trying to, to make an impact. How stressful is that to, to have an ad? You're, I mean, the pressure's on you. That's got to be a great ad. You people have got to be talking about your ad. Otherwise you're fired. There, I mean, it's a lot of pressure, but funny enough, I never really felt it. So like I, I worked in on the social media side. So like there were like, we had a brand advertising team. We had a media team that placed the buys. We had, you know, like in this world where there's $80 million a year spent on marketing, $150 million, $300 million a year spent on marketing in the Super Bowl is like, an, you know, one twentieth of their entire ad spent in a year. It's a number one, puts a little bit less pressure on things. Like there are some brands out there and that's all they do and, that, and that's all they can afford. Uh, but if you're Budweiser, if you're Audi, if you're Ford or whatever, right, this is just more than campaign in the season that you have to to perform it's still very stressful it's still very integrated there's dozens if not hundreds of players involved in getting all the intricacies right but there are some things that you can do that make it a little bit more known in terms of what the outcomes are going to be so you know the placements you know studying the history of the super bowl is a good place to start understanding you know, what quarters have historically trended, what kind, you know, looking at the gameplay and seeing the matchup and seeing if you think it's going to be a close game or a blowout, that can indicate whether or not you might want to take a flyer on a later quarter. If it's going to be a close game and it's going to be a blowout, you want to go earlier. So having, being a football fan helps and I'm, I'm a huge football fan. So I've always been able, not that my input really charted out where we would go, but I'd say one thing that my team's I've always been on the front forefront of is I was at Group M when we, the Volkswagen team, that was my kind of sister brand. I was on Audi and Volkswagen was right down the hallway. They were the first brand to, to ever, you know, do a preview of the Super Bowl spot on YouTube before the game. So two weeks before, and then that became a massive trend. My team was the first team to ever put a hashtag on the back end of the Super Bowl spot as a call to action which was the first of its kind and then led to 90% adoption in the industry after the fact within about two years, I think 90% of all brands were doing hashtag CTAs on the back of their commercials. And so some of those things, they might sound incredibly small, but they're actually quite, quite massive. Cause if you're putting your TV spot out on YouTube two weeks in advance, you're putting paid media in on it, right? All you're really trying to do is you're trying to get enough viewership on those Super Bowl spots 
so that all of the endemic press starts picking up and starts calling you a buzzworthy TV spot, right? If they start doing that, then you start getting on the Today Show, Good Morning America. They start featuring your brand in the days leading up to the Super Bowl spot. And so now at the whole, you know, advertising industry and the media industry at large has told the American consuming population, tune in to the Budweiser spot, tune in to the Audi spot. It's a good one. It's probably going to rake high on ad meter, right? And so you're conditioning the, the consuming public through the press to really anticipate your spot so that, you know, when it, when it hits, they already kind of like it and you already kind of know that, right? You can also do pre-testing through like Ipsos and Asymmetrics and see whether or not like panels are interested in your spot or interested in the people that you chose to be in your spot and stuff like that. And then on the back end with the CTA stuff, what that really allowed us to do was to, to drag out the conversation, you know, after the Super Bowl and create more of a, you know, return on investment, let's say. So if, if we go into something like the Super Bowl, of course, you're going to look at you know, how the ad performs in the ad mirror. You're pre, you know, if you're a direct consumer brand or if you have a website, you're trying to send something into a retail establishment or something like that. You can even bank on sales as being a part of what you would expect to get out of the Super Bowl spot. But from a social media perspective, what we go in trying to figure out any big major cultural tentpole event, we're trying to win share a voice, right? So we want to take over as much of the conversation as possible. It's a lot easier to do that when you sprint it out over the course of two weeks than one day or two hours. So, so, so that became really impactful for us. We used to create a lot of buzz around the Super Bowl spots. And then on the back end of them, we'd create some sort of a contest or some sort of a sweepstakes or some sort of a call to action that made people want to interact with Audi or whoever after the game for multiple days on end. I, I love that insight. I hadn't actually thought about all of that sort of pre-game around the advert and the, the post-game analysis almost. So you could, you could put it in, in those sort of sports terms. So that, that's, that's fascinating, trying to get more value out of that very expensive real estate that, you, <laughs> that you've just you bought. Have to. I, I tell people all the time, you know, coming in as the social media guy with very low pressure, what I try to tell CMOs is, look, you're, you're going to spend $25 million on this ad when all is said and done, right? The creative, you're going to go out and you're going to hire like the best production company. You're going to make this massive Super Bowl spot, probably going to be a minute in length, which is 13, $14 million in today's age with inflation, all that kind of stuff. You're going to build in all kinds of levers from a paid media perspective. You're going to beef up your website. You're going to beef up your, you have to beef up your website. I've seen websites crash like all too often on the back of Super Bowl traffic. So you've got to beef it up so you can handle all the traffic. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into the investment. It's not just a, a $5 million or a $10 million media investment. It's the creative, it's the production, it's the IT, it's all of that stuff, right? So if you're going to spend money on all that stuff, why wouldn't you want to have like an $80,000 insurance policy on the night of to make sure that the whole thing goes well from a social media perspective, right? I come in as the insurance broker, like you want to make sure that people talk well about your spot, right? Okay, I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, I'll make sure that people think that your spot was one of the best. I suppose this is why it's mainly the large agencies that that do this kind of work. This is not a pokey opportunity. And I think if if the regular person thinks about a Super Bowl ad, they think it's just an ad. And it's very interesting getting some insight into all of the build up. As you say, the insurance, you've got to make sure that your investment, I mean, this for some companies it's more than, you know, a twentieth of their of the ad spend in the year. This is a this is a make or break, make or break for their business. For some CEOs, it could mean the difference between getting fired or staying. You know, like it's it's huge investment, especially with today's day and age with that and the shareholders and stuff like that. You're just not going to stick around. If, well, I mean, see what happened with Solo Stove when they threw that Snoop Dogg under the bus for that that influencer partnership. Like, if marketing goes wrong in today's day and age, off with their head. You know. Yeah. So. I think I'm going to jump ahead a, a little bit because you've started sure. your own business. So you you worked in this sort of fast-paced, big-budget advertising industry, and now you're going into a slightly well into a, a very big growth industry, but a, a slightly different industry, which is the cannabis industry. And you want to launch new brands in this in this space. So, I, but I take it it's not just people who are smoking joints and so on it is the it is the accoutrements around it so it's the oils it's the 
whatever other activities go along go along with it. Talk to me about mm -hmm. why this space and what what was in your mind when you left Gary V. <laughs> well, it was in, so it's interesting. Number why I left Gary V is nothing personal. Me and them are still friends. We still text message all that kind of stuff. It was just time. I had been there for almost a decade and, you know, I'd been working on some stuff behind the scenes in, in kind of stealth. Me and a really good friend of mine from when I was in high school age, we've been building a cannabis infused seltzer brand to bring to market. And I thought last year was going to be the year that that was going to take over a large part of my life. Hasn't really materialized that way. The brand is still on pathway where, you know, we're still we're still formulating. It's getting ready to launch in the state of Missouri. So things are still going according to plan. It just hasn't taken over my life to the same extent I thought it would. But it's okay because I knew all along I was going to have to like augment my income as a startup with, you know, they're not going to just take my huge fat salary and my investors are going to be cool with that. So I knew I had to like build a, you know, a consulting firm off of the back end of that. So that's what I've done. And interestingly enough, one thing just kind of led to another. And I've wound, I've wound up coming in contact with a few other cannabis brands because I'm involved in a startup in this space. And uh, I wound up procuring a couple of other clients that are uh, pretty close to the one that I'm, that, that the brand that I'm founding. So the, the cannabis seltzer brand that I'm launching is called Fuzzy Water. Uh, you'll find out more about that if we talk about the, the podcast. Um, and then I linked up with a company called Mana Supply Company, and they are a manufacturer. They're actually our manufacturer for the shelter brand. And they also have dispensaries in some states, and they also make and launch their own brands of edibles and stuff like that. And then another company that I work with is called American Weed Co. They're, they want to be the Budweiser of cannabis, which is why they like me. Because I've worked on Budweiser before, but I, I got in contact with them through Mana Supply Co. because... The founder of Mana Supply Co. is on the board of the National Cannabis Roundtable, which is the largest trade organization in cannabis in the United States. And, and he sits on the board of a gentleman named Ryan Brooks and his wife, Jess. And, and they, they obviously found out about my Budweiser tenure and history there with, with the AB and Dev portfolio. And they loved some of the work that we had done telling stories in that, in the beer space. So they brought me on so that I can help them do the same for cannabis and just all is going exceptionally well that that's kind of the bulk and lion share of my clients is in the cannabis space but i i do some stuff outside of that i've worked with apparel companies i've worked with i've worked with a direct mail company i've worked with i, I currently have an artist under management right now who just signed with uh, atlantic records he's a christian rapper so that's super unique and interesting but yeah i mean the, the decision to leave gary was nothing personal it was just time it was time for me to try something new and then working with smaller brands also wasn't really that much of a leap because even though I have a lot of experience working with the Fortune 50 even, the pa my last three years at Vayner were actually working for our, our sister company, the Sasha Group, which, is, which was designed to work with small businesses outside of the Fortune 500. So it's, it was called the Sasha, it was called the Sasha Group because Gary's father's name is Sasha Vaynerchuk. And as we all know, Gary got to start working for his dad in the liquor store in New Jersey. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I, I'm used to working with Wall Street and Main Street brands. <laughs> I had a, a very interesting call earlier on with a, a startup based in California. And in the startup space, it's quite interesting, you know, coming from a background of working with a lot of startups and seeing what's going to work and not gonna, what's not going to work. In your experience in working with startups, how do you deal with companies where you see you've got passionate founders, you've got folks who, are, who are, believe they're onto a winning thing? Sometimes there is potential for this business to, to do well, and sometimes you can see that this is a non-starter from the beginning. How do you have that conversation? This is not the case here, but I, I've just had in the past where I've seen clients come in, they've got money to spend, and they, they, they're ready to do it, but you can you can tell that that business is not going to make it on, on the long term. What, how do you deal with that situation? Do you take the money? Do you guide them? What are, have you come across that before? Yeah, no, I mean, I, so for sure, especially kind of when you're first starting out and don't have a lot of contracts and you're trying to 
scrape to get by. I think you're more willing to take on contracts that you probably shouldn't. You're more willing to let your guard down and try some things. But I've already, you know, in two quarters of operations, I've already been burned using that, deploying that strategy. And what I, you know, I I learned the hard way, I obviously had a really good first quarter. I had a really lukewarm second quarter of existence. And coming into the, the beginning parts of 2024, you know, I just decided to kind of double down on what I, the reasons why I wanted to do this in the first place. I was tired of working in an agency setting where I just kind of had brands thrust upon me and I had no situation or no say or no input into whether or not I was going to work on it or not. It was just their, their company had a need and I had to be a company guy. But now as a business owner, right, like what do I care about? What are my values? What types of industries will I or will I work in? And what kind of founders am I attracted to? Like who, who can I spend time with and it never gets old? And I think that's a crucial part, really understanding whether or not there's some chemistry between you as a founder of your company and the founders of the companies you choose to work with. If you don't, if you can't see yourself liking being on the other end of a phone call with these people, you should probably run in the other direction. And you're not should probably, you should run in the other direction. You should also start, you know, if, if, if that's not enough to convince you, you should start to assess how much time you think each of these clients are going to be. You should give them demerits for being needier than other clients or whatever. Just so whatever you think in your gut, this is going to wind up being in terms of a commitment or investment of your time. Because I'm, I, I, I was in a situation where I had two clients out of my six clients that I had in, in Q3 of last year. I had two clients that were, that were taking up 40% of my time, but only paying me for 10% of my time. And so like, those are hard situations to get out of, like in a very, you know, polite and and graceful way. Like they don't typically end well. One of you is either going to, you're going to get fired or you're going to, or you're going to fire them. And uh, so I'd say to avoid the heartache of actually having to do those things, you should try to put a little bit more effort in on the front end of really assessing whether or not these are going to be problem clients or not. You know, like, and, and I don't know where I picked up this terminology. It was probably with the last couple of years at Sasha Groups. We did that kind of exercise pretty frequently. You, know, you would think that a client with less money would be less work. Not the case at all. Usually the clients with less money, every dollar matters so much more. So they get in your face that much more, right? So that's usually, it's unfortunate, but that's why I see a lot of companies that focus on small business. They wind up going up the ladder when it comes to trying to recruit larger clients, you know, even the ones that are designed to work with smaller clients don't wind up staying in that lane for very long. They all try to go with the bigger fish. Yeah, I I agree. I've had that similar experience of smaller clients give you as much a headache and take up as much time as somebody larger. And the larger guys are typically allowing you to do your work, whereas the smaller Mm -hmm. guys sometimes have a bit more time on their hands to to get up to mischief and uh, Say what about this? What about that? What and as you said, every every dollar counts. I want yeah. to I want to go back quickly into the into the cannabis industry because you've focused in on that on that industry and it definitely is a a growth area, especially in the states. But it's a complicated product to sell, I reckon, because different states have got different laws. You've got yeah. I'm sure advertising restraints up to your up to your ears. So. Mm-hmm. Just talk to me about how complica- complex the, the, the communications or marketing uh, environment is for, for the cannabis in- industry in the, in the States. Well, it's incredibly complex, but it's not impossible. So um, I think the thing that you got to rest your hat on is that it's still, even though like some of the more kind of original states that legalize like California, Colorado, uh, Oregon, Washington, like some of those West Coast states in the United States, they've been legal longer. They're still like 10 years old, like at best, right? Like, so from a branding perspective, they're still babies. And most people don't really know who any of these brands are. You know, like, and there's, of course, some people that are really into smoking weed that know who some of these brands are. But by and large, most of the consumers in each of these states have no clue who these big player brands are. Even the biggest of the big brands in, in cannabis are relatively, have relatively low awareness scores, right? So 
now, now play it out a little bit, right? And the reason why the platforms, specifically the social media platforms, have such a big problem with you selling your wares on them is because it's not federally legal, right? So it's harder for them to wrap their arms around and really kind of make heads, of ta- heads and tails of things. And their devices, and I don't know this for a fact, I'm just reading into it anecdotally because I've been in this world, I've worked in social media for half my life. Your advertisement winds up becoming six inches from somebody's face, right? That's a big difference of why, a, you know, a TV platform might accept cannabis advertising and your TV screens like all the way across the room, or maybe billboard advertisers might let you, or even desktop advertisers or whatever. Some of the more traditional media, you know, doesn't seem to have as much of a problem with cannabis advertising. And I think it's also because they're not making as much money as they used to, so they can't be as picky. But the the duopoly, the, the the metas and the Googles of the world, they're the kingpins and they can be choosy. They don't need your money, right? So, and they also deploy algorithms that are highly addictive to kids. So I understand why it's hard to advertise cannabis products, right? I, I would do the same thing if I was in those companies' positions. But it doesn't mean that you can't do anything. And I think the thing that I keep reminding a lot of the people I work with is, we get to come into these markets and we get to be the first generation of cannabis brands that people fall in love with. So let's take advantage of that. Let's go rewind the clock. Let's do some really sexy looking out at home stuff. You know, let's, let's do some pretty cool TV ads. Even if, you know, like, I, I, it's not, it's not 1984. I understand that we're a nice 40 years beyond, beyond those historic ads, but, but let's go out and, and, and let's go be diverse in everything and let's go explore new markets. Let's open up and let's, direct people to our dispensaries using really well-placed billboard ads. Like, let's not overthink this thing. And, and that excites me a little bit. You know, it gives me a chance to, to, to attack this in a different way than I have in the past. And those, you know, the duopoly, they'll come around. They'll come, they have to come around, right? And I don't even think it's going to take all 50 states being on board for them to come around. I think once the insurance companies are allowed to provide insurance to cannabis brands. Once banks are allowed to start taking cannabis brands money, I think everybody else is going to kind of fall in line and, and start treating this uh, a lot more favorably. And I think it's got a lot of momentum in the, in the States. You know, it's got politics on its side, even though nothing will probably get done this year because it's an election year. But like beyond that, I think it's something like between 70 to 90% of the U S consumer thinks that cannabis should be legal, but you know, fairly regulated. Most of the politicians across the country are are receptive to the idea of legalizing cannabis. So I think it's a matter of time. And here's the thing. I worked on alcohol for six years, right? maybe longer than that if you count some of the project-based work that I did in spirits and in wine and stuff like that. I worked in alcohol for a long time. But I, don't, I no longer drink now because I've, I've seen the research. I know what it does for you. I'm not going to put that stuff in my body anymore. But, you know... Cannabis, even though it does have a psychoactive property to it, and psychoactive benefit to it, if you want to think about it that way, right? It could be perceived in a similar way to alcohol. It's still, unlike alcohol, there actually are wellness benefits to it. And I think about specifically veterans, right? People with PTSD, trauma, you know, people that are healing major injuries, major brain injuries. And I think about what the, what the mobile phone is doing to the younger generations of kids across the world, right? The amount of usage, the amount of addiction to algorithms, that kind of thing. You know, a lot of kids, and I say kids, you know, very liberally, because I could consider a 25-year-old, a kid way over-prescribed to, you know, ADHD medicine, antidepressants, SSRIs. And even if they're not over-prescribed, even if it's necessary, I don't know. I have a healthy dose of skepticism towards big pharma and big medicine. And I, I look at a plant like the cannabis plant as a, a natural alternative to the, some of those things. So as a guy that's married and has four kids that are all under the age ten, of 10, I want my kids coming into a world where they have options like cannabis. And, you know, that's I don't even really consume the product all that much outside of like topicals and maybe a gummy here or there. But I do like that. I like the plant as an option for certain types of demographics throughout society. So you made an interesting point about it's that folks don't know about specific cannabis brands. And you spoke about sort of a 10-year-old industry. 
And I often say that brands are overnight successes in 10 years. So typically the, the work that you're going to be start doing now, especially in this industry is sort of an, in its nascent stage, similar to when Google started, you had Google, you had Jeeves, you had hundreds of different search engines starting out. But the ones that built uh, awareness, the ones that built a brand, are the ones that are with us now because people want to default to something they want. So you're going to have the Coca-Cola mm -hmm. version of cannabis. You're going to have the Pepsi version and uh, you know yeah. versions yeah. like that. And and as you said, that's something that you'll be you'll be developing. And I think you know who better. That's why I'm so excited for it. You know, I, I've been a student of advertising my whole life, and you know, I would be remiss if part of my career didn't include developing a category in a really meaningful way. So in, in a way in which, you know, some of the people that I work with and I put on my teams can actually wind up in some of these textbooks that are going into the university level, like 30 or 40 issues. That's really cool. That's a, a big responsibility. And, and I don't take it lightly. Yeah. So as we're winding up, let's talk a little bit. Uh, I mean, we've touched on uh, fuzzy-ish. So why don't we go into your podcast and how that started and uh, what the point of that podcast is? Yeah. So I stopped drinking alcohol six years ago almost. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. It was before it was cool to do. <laughs> Nowadays, I, I, back then, I felt like a complete outcast, especially as a guy that ran a massive multi-million dollar beer portfolio inside of Vader <laughs> You know, beer was like, every 10 feet from me, there was, I had a beer fridge, like behind my desk. Like there was, uh, we had a massive expense budget and took clients out to drink all the time. And we lived in New York city, which had a massive drinking culture after work. This is pre COVID where, you know, there was no working from home. It was, we could go up to the bar two or three nights a week. And so, but you know, like I stopped drinking because my doctor told me I was going to get gout if I didn't stop drinking because I was consuming so much yeast from the beer. And, and I had young kids at the time. I had two, my two oldest kids were, let me see, two and one years old at the time, I think, something like that. And, you know, I just didn't like being drunk around them. I didn't like being hungover around them. My wife didn't like me being drunk or hungover around them. It was just happening all too, all too often. So I quit drinking and it really wasn't that hard to dr quit drinking. I wouldn't say that I was an alcoholic by any stretch of the imagination, but it was just a, it was a cultural thing. It was a lifestyle thing because like I said, it was so omnipresent in my life. So I wound up moving out to Cal. Me and Gary talked. We wound up shipping me off to California so I could work on something outside of beer. And and you know over the over the years I started reconnecting with some of my old buddies. One of them was my friend JM, and he was going through very similar stages of his life at the same time. And we started noticing some trends around sober curiosity and stuff like that. And one day we were ironically out at a bar and I was having a non-alcoholic beer and he was drinking, he was still drinking at the time. So I think he was drinking a regular beer, but we heard of a, we heard of a product from Stone Brewery or something like that out in California. They had mixed, or maybe it was Dogfish, Dogfish had IP. I can't remember exactly who the brand was, but I think it might've been Stone. Anyway, they had mixed a non-alcoholic beer with cannabis and I thought it was the most mind blowing. I was like, wait a minute, you can drink a beer. And get high and not drunk, <laughs> not be smelly and nasty and gross and have like all the effects of alcohol and not be hungover and all that kind of stuff. But, like that is ingenious. <laughs> it's, it's like one thing led to another. He, JM hit me up a couple of months later. It was like, Hey, I think we should start a, I, like a seltzer brand and take, take advantage of the category and use it with, with THC and. I said, yes, let's do that. <laughs> so one thing led to another. We've been on that journey for a little while, getting that brand off the ground, getting, you know, our investors in line, getting formulation, getting manufacturing lined up, distribution, sales team, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where we're right at the doorstep of launch. But along the way, I just told him, hey, look, like we should do something in the inner in in the in the interim. We shouldn't wait to start socializing this concept out to the world. So I said, Hey, I've always wanted to do a podcast. Would you want to do that with me? Like, we don't have to have it be super branded or anything like that. We don't have to even talk about cannabis. We don't want to. The main point that I was trying to kind of espouse to him was like, look, the world has this really weird perception when it comes to people that are sober. And I think it comes from Hollywood. It comes from corporate America. It, and there's a stigma around being sober. And, and usually when you say you're sober, people think 
you wrapped your car around a tree or you are in a 12 step program or, you know, you killed somebody, or, you know, you beat your wife or whatever the case may be. And, and that may be the truth for like 10% or 20% of people. But I think by and large, especially in the circles I've run in, in like the high end executive circles of marketing and advertising, most of the really, really high up dudes and ladies out there do not drink. And if they do, it's very sparingly. <laughs> they like to keep their wits about them. And they're some of the most noteworthy people out there that you can imagine. So I just wanted to build a podcast where we could tell stories of amazing people that don't drink and give a little bit more shine to those people and and why they don't drink and, and what fuels them towards achievement. And, and yeah, so we launched in September. It's going pretty well. I think we got about 24 episodes in or something like that right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and we, we continue to do it. And, and we're, we're, we understand that like, there's going to be some people out there too, that are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not sober at your consuming cannabis. And, and that's right. You know, like technically you're probably not sober at your consuming cannabis, but, um, I think Everybody's got their own definition of, of different things. We, we do, we attack head on people that, uh, that are genuine alcoholics that needed AA to, to survive life that have been on the brink of suicide all the way to we'll deal with people that aren't drinking at all, but are actually microdosing mushrooms to get through their anxiety. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't really care. It's not necessarily the word sobriety. Isn't something where I'm, I'm like afraid to lean in on it. It's more of this like sober alcohol free or sober AF lifestyle or in the United States, we call it Cali sober, right? Like California <laughs> sober, you know, I, I think it's just, it, to me, it's just like changing the stereotype or the stigma around sobriety. And I think people should want sobriety to be lumped into the way we're describing it because it'll make it cooler. You don't have to be completely free of everything. I, I had this big debate with my wife the other day because she had mentioned, well, you're not really sober. And I was like, well, I don't know. I had to take it from this thing where I was like, what if you don't, what if you don't consume any alcohol or any, any street drugs, but you're on antidepressants, right? Are you sober? And she was like, yes, you're sober. And I was like, why are you sober? Mm. And she's like, well, because that's not a street drug. And I was like, so the only reason you're sober is because of a government definition of what sobriety is? Or what's legal and what's not legal. To, in my definition, if you really think about the, the ramifications, literally anything that alters your mind should be you're not sober, right? Which would even potentially be cigarettes or isons, you know? Like addiction is addiction. Like if you're addicted to porn, are you sober? Yeah. I don't know. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's quite, a, quite a complicated subject. I mean, during Lent, I generally give up alcohol and I, had, I tried alcohol-free beers for the first time. And I thought, man, this is bad. And now I have, I basically exclusively, exclusively buy alcohol free beers. And there's such a great variety here in Norway. And I've mm -hmm. also gone into alcohol free, you know, gins and things like that. So in terms of the sobriety, sobriety side, yeah, I also felt I just didn't like being tired after drinking a beer and, that, and things like that. And there are some nice alternatives. And I work in the alcohol industry in in the UK and have done a lot of startup brands in, in this space. So probably worth chatting about some of my experiences and, and maybe helping you get into the UK if that's something, yeah. something you're interested in. So my very interesting is, industry. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite, no, well, I wouldn't even call it a non-alcoholic beer because it's not a beer, but there's a product called Hoplark. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. No. It's a, it's a ready to drink tea brand. Like it's a canned beverage of tea. It's like a tall, tall boy, but it's got like, terpene. I don't know if it's got terpenes in it, but it definitely has hops in them. So you could drink a, uh, a cold black tea that tastes like an IPA. It's awesome. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, there's some some great innovations out in that space. And I do think in the next in the next couple of years, the non-alcoholic category is going to grow tremendously. The beers are actually tasting like beers, which is which mm -hmm. is useful. And there's some really nice, I mean, even martinis coming out with sort of non-alcoholic Oh yeah, cocktails there's tons, and that. So, you know, so there's entire bars now that are non-alcoholic. They, you know, there's enough mocktails out there, seltzer beverages, non-alcoholic yeah. beers, tea brands. There's enough brands that are actually creating these infusions that make people. I think the number one thing that for me when I came off of alcohol was 
feeling like an outsider, right? I'd be the only sober person at a bar full of drunk people. Yeah. Now there's so many people that are interested in this movement that you go to a bar and it's like 50, 50, like half the people might not be drinking at all. Half of them are, but there's enough options now at the bars for them to not have to drink and they can still feel like they're not the outsider. So Joe, we could obviously keep jabbering on for the rest of the day. This is quite fun, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to call it there. Where can I send folks who are interested in number one, your podcast and number two, your services? Sure. Fuzzyishpodcast.com. We'll have links to all of our episodes. You can also check out our social media there. Fuzzyish is spelled with two Z's and two E's. So F-U-Z-Z-E-E-I-S-H podcast.com. And yeah, you link up with all of our social media, check out all of our episodes. If there's any specific episode you like, if you want to reach out to any of our guests, I can help facilitate that dialogue. You can also reach out to me via email, joe at quatronebrands.com. Uh, if you have any questions about the podcast, if you want to talk to me about my consulting endeavors, that's fine. And I'm also available on social media myself as a person. Uh, if you type in super quatron into Google, S U P E R. Q-U-A-T-T-R-O-N-E. I've been using that handle since about 2008 across any social media I can find. So I've got some pretty good SEO juice there. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, probably where I'm the most active in the DM. So LinkedIn me. And yeah, I'm happy to talk. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time and a fascinating insight into the big leagues and also the, the high spirit world of uh, cannabis. So yeah, thanks so much, Joe. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. Mm, come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth.